me, this podcast has a simple mission, and it is to act as a bridge between our generations. We talk about life, we talk about culture, music, their successes, their failures, their regrets, and their legacies. Happy New Year and welcome to 2024, which brings us to a new season on the podcast. Thank you for sticking around. If you're new here, let me bring you up to speed. To put it simply, this podcast is a way to bridge the gap between generations. I've had the privilege of speaking to some really brilliant guests with incredible stories. And there has been so many lessons along the way. And I can tell you there's even more to look forward to in the coming episodes. And so with that said, my guests in this episode... Uh, Mr. and Mrs. Paul Lale. It's a funny story. They both go by Tony. So there's Mr. Tony and Mrs. Tony Lale. Uh, now, the short story is that I met them at the three year launch of Puff Puff Ministry, which is a fantastic business run by their daughters. And I performed at one of their events. Uh, and from there, we scheduled a time to meet and have this conversation. And since then, I can't begin to tell you how instrumental Uncle Paul has been in the life of this podcast how supportive and encouraging he's been it's just phenomenal and on this episode we speak to what well, i speak to both of them about their marriage about what it's been like raising five girls uh, about migration about business music and everything in between the entire conversation was so long and so i guess fun and enjoyable that it's, it's going to have to be split into two episodes that's how good it was so with that said, and without taking any more time, let's get on with the podcast. For the sake of everybody listening, uh, what, what is your name, sir, and what is your name, ma'am? I'll let you go first. My name is Oluwatoyin Ayokumi Olaleye. Sir. My name is Paul Oluwatoyin Akomu Olaleye. Wow. And this is actually a first. It's the first time um, I've ever spoken to a couple at the same time. Usually it's been one first or the other second. Um, and already before, before we turn on the camera, before we turn on the microphones, <clears throat> I have to stress how the dynamics of you both is so infectious. <laughs> and it's, I, I didn't know what to expect, but this is it's just so warm and everything else. So what year were you born? I was born in 62 January in Ibadan, UCH. You were born in Ibadan? Yes. Please. So was I. I'm all bad. And you see it. <laughs> and what year were you born? Oh. <laughs> My own is complicated. My okay. dad gave me Swan affidavit. Which means and I believe, I don't know, that's not my real age, but in the Swan affidavit it says sixty-nine. Okay. But my older sister told me it's not. You know, because our parents in those days they have passport age, they have official age and all those things. So that's this... what I'm living with. <laughs> but where were you born? Is that, is, was I was that born in Ibada. Okay. I don't know where, but I was born in Ibada. <laughs> so, okay, if what's your earliest memory then of being born in Ibada? Wow, I think from what my mom told me, I was brought to Lagos when I was like a toddler, because my dad is a reverend, so he was transferred after attending the Emmanuel College of Theology, he was transferred to Lagos. I was okay. already born before then, so they brought me to Lagos, and I remember my dad came to Lagos in 1972, according to my mom. Okay. Story I had. So, my memory of me being in Ibadan is just what they told me that I used to be like running around, <laughs> you know, Paalaya this house. Okay. Paalaya pa happens to be my dad's uncle. Oh, I see. So, your dad was a reverend. What yes, was your mom's? Was what did your mom do for a living? Yeah, 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 yeah. Reverend's yeah, wife an and a businessman. Yeah, yeah. She's an entrepreneur. <laughs> okay. Yeah, she 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 was a trader. She traded in Ashow fee. Poultry. What is called Ashow fee today? It used to be called Ashow fee, but a lot of people call it Ashow fee now. What I'm wearing. Yeah. Um. And um, she traded in. Um, she had po- a po- a poultry. We had Coca Cola. M- we had more than, I think she had more than three thousand birds, chickens. Wow. Yeah. We used to get about 300 crates of eggs every day. Wow. And she also traded in Coca-Cola, Nigerian bottling company, Coca-Cola and stuff like that. She used to get like a truckload of Coca-Cola on a daily basis. Wow. Yeah. Sounds she very industrious. Yeah. <laughs> Do you remember what your parents did for a living at the time of your birth? Yes. Oh, me? Yes. Oh, my time of my birth. I know that my father, my father um, is late. He passed in this house 
in 2018. Oh, I'm really sorry for that. Um, yes. Um, my father, I call him my libero. Anyway, I'll go back. Okay, I'll just tell a story. I understand when I was a little baby once, he had a beetle and I locked myself in that the, inside the beetle or whatever. But what I'm trying to say is like, okay, to answer your question, my father joined what was British and French Bank on the 4th of July, 1955. Okay, So he had a car. His car was LO4755. 47 is the American Independence Day, but he joined the British and French Bank. He was staff number 22. He was the first Nigerian manager to join what is today UBA, but wow. he used to be called British and French Bank. So my father was a banker. Um, I remember he was the area manager for UBA in Western Nigeria. West region, the you, Nigeria was divided into three: west, east, and north. So it was the neither the rivers, the river Niger and River Benue that the management of UBA used to divide the territory. So my father had responsibility for the west region, up to Kotangora. Oh, okay. Uh, so, um, so the Niger, I used to go with him on holiday to the Kianju Dam. He used to go to Sapele. So he was the area manager of the bank in that territory. Um, the other two area managers were expatriates. Um, the area manager in North was an English, I mean, Caucasian, British person. And I think area manager East as well. So to an extent, I'm grateful, ever grateful. I had a very privileged um, uh, background. You know, I used to go to Ibada Recreation Club. He was a treasurer. And then my, he was very close to late Bishop Finn, who was a Catholic bishop for the Ibadan Diocese. He was like a confidant of a lot of the hierarchy in the Catholic Church. And um, so that's kind of background I had. And that's why, okay, for example, um, I had my primary education in Lagos, but my father made me to go to Loyola College Ibadan, which um, a, it was a Catholic school of um, the diocese. And um, incidentally, the f well, five boys, four boys, I happened to be the only one that went to Loyola. Um, <laughs> so my father has influenced me a great deal by the choice of school he made for me. And um, to an extent, the kind of support he gave my wife in, my, in our marriage. So that's why for me, I always pay a lot of gratitude to him for his influence in my life. So to answer your question, I grew up in the home of um, a bank official in right. the Bada territory. You know what, something, that, <clears throat> something that's just struck me now is you both, usually in these conversations, when people reference the lives of their parents, it's not usually as in touch as you both seem. Uh -huh. So what is apparent now is it seems like you're both very connected to your parents and to their lives. Yeah. I mean, you spoke at depth that, uh, uh, um, about your mom and what she did and the, the kinds of things she traded in. And you've just spoken at length about the kind of job your dad did. Um, and that's, I don't know if it's unusual, but it's definitely worth noting, you know, because I've spoken to a few people and they don't usually stress that connection. Why do you think that is? Why, why is it to do with the way you were raised? How, is, how do you have such great connections to the lives of your parents? Yeah, I, I would say that in my own particular case, it's because I was very close to my mom. And, you know, she used to tell me a lot of stories and she used to, you know, tell me about business. And I watched her do business and everything. So for me, I had that close, you know, attachment. Mm -hmm. And... Um, I learned a great deal from her because whatever I am today is as a, as a result of my relationship with my mom and as a result of all the values she has imbibed in me. That's, and yeah. whatever she taught me is what I'm teaching my daughters today. How many, do you have, how many siblings do you have? Um, we have six children from my mom. From, okay. so I've got five siblings. I'm the fourth of six. You're number four of six. Number four of six. I've got the first one is a, is a man. The second, a lady. Actually, I have only one brother. So okay. the rest of us are girls. So, right. So I'm the fourth of six. And the third 
daughter in the Do family. You think all your siblings have would say the same thing about their closeness with your mom or were well, you special? From my own observation, I don't think so. Okay. Because <laughs> because we grew up together. They might have their own whatever they want to say about her, but um, personally observing the dynamics in the family, I think I had the best. <laughs> <laughs> Is your mom still with us? No, she's late. She died 36 years ago. Oh, I'm sorry to hear that. It's okay. <laughs> but your dad? My dad is still around. He lives in Lagos, Nigeria. He lives in Ikorodu town. He's a retired Anglican clergy. So, I think I must have mentioned before, I lived all my life in the vicarage before I got married. So, wow. we used to be referred to as Omoyad, Omoafa. <laughs> and you know, all eyes were on us. Wow. So you needed to be, you know, very careful what you do. But then, sometimes it doesn't really matter. You can do whatever you like. Live your life. If you know the system, then yeah. you can work it. And you can work it. <laughs> it's so funny. I'm skipping around a bit there. But then, what was it like meeting somebody with that kind of background at that, at that time? Because I, I don't know if I'm assuming here, but what, what it sounds like you described, it sounds like, not sheltered, but it sounds like you, were, mm. you weren't allowed to mix with everybody the same way everybody else was. So what, what was that like meeting somebody or getting to know somebody with that kind of background? You know, I'll answer your question, but um, I'm not a storyteller, but... I, I love it, by the way. Please feel free to... <laughs> okay. Um, I met her in the vicinity of a church. Okay. But not in a church. Um, Behind the church. <laughs> in Fadei, there's um, St. Jude's. Fadi. Thank you, yeah. Then I have a cousin, Brother Yomi Alabi. He had a fish business, like the kind of Hebrew kind of operation and stuff like that. And I used to go there to help him do the books and talk with him and stuff like that. So that business was in that premises in Fadi. Right. Fadi. And so this fateful evening, after we had done all the paperwork and stuff like that, you know, we saw some pretty ladies. I remember that green dress, nice dress, and I was attracted to it. But um, so that was where the story right. began. Right. But one thing she said recently, many years after we mar got married, is like she didn't imagine she would see me again after that first. Wow. So you can imagine the kind of obstacle I had to break. <laughs> and I remember one. I was trying to get her phone number and she said, we don't have a telephone. And there and then the phone rang and she asked me, you know, so anyway, you know, I said to my daughters, you know, I served in Enugu in 83 in NYC, National Youth Service. And um, I had the opportunity to compare how, you know, an Igbo lady expresses love compared to how a Yoruba lady expresses <laughs> love. So I said to my daughter that, don't be a Yoruba girl. <laughs> so, you know, it's, it's like, Yoruba girls play hard to get. Yeah. The evil girl is like, she likes you and she's going to express it. But I think it's a social, it's a, it's a, it's a um, social process. The way the Yoruba culture raises mm. a female child, I'm not sorry. So. Can I say something? To <laughs> you know, growing up, yeah. your, your mothers will tell you, don't let a man touch you. Okay, now you are meeting a man. You are remem <laughs> remembering what your mom said. Don't let any man touch you. Don't let any man touch you. And somebody is talking to you like, ah, well, you just be moving back. Like, why are you talking to me? Like, mm. no, 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 no. It's like, so I think our parents are already put that thing there. That, you know, but I don't know how they raise Ibu okay. girls. Maybe so, they, they okay, I'll tell you. I, had, I have a colleague who in Citibank. His name is Harry Nelson. <laughs> He's ethic. And so I'm, what I'm trying to say is the cultural process for raising girls mm. differs with different parts of Nigeria. Of course. So I'm not ethic, but from my colleague who is ethic, I would narrate how he says the ethic raised their girls. girls. Okay. And, you know, Henry would say to us that an ethic girl is nurtured to take care of a man. And that mm. when a partner comes to the house, excuse me here, she's going to ask the husband, what do you want to eat first? 
up or down. <laughs> <laughs> you know, no, 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 and that's con- that's a big contrast to. Yeah. What a Yoruba girl is like, don't let the man touch you. Don't yeah, let the man yeah, touch yeah, you. So, yeah, yeah. I mean, <laughs> whereas in the north as well, I remember when I used to audit, I used to work in Panaka Foster. I used to go and audit Bash Sugar Company in Bashita. Okay. And um, that was where I interacted with, you know, Hausa culture and stuff like that. And you realize that Hausa girls were always looking to marry Yoruba people because the Hausa girl is hidden she's kept ah. so they feel liberated if they get married to a yoruba or something so what i'm trying to say is that nigeria is a big massive country absolutely they say about two or three hundred ethnic groups and you know each community have their values of how they raise their female child yeah by virtue of my work as a salesperson in coca-cola and an auditor i moved around I'm all, I wasn't a player, but what I'm saying, I, I moved around <laughs> Nigeria a great deal, sure. so I could see the difference. So I was just trying to explain the perspective, yeah. you know, and stuff yeah. like that. At what age did you meet? Or how, how old were you when you met? In 1989, it was 20. last quarter of 1989 we met. I was 27. Okay. Yeah. If yeah, you were 27, 20, you were 20. 20. 20. Oh. Yeah. Six, five. Basically. Basically. Something like that. <laughs> okay. Um, <clears throat> to go back a little bit then. So, um, did you also school in Lagos, primary, secondary school? Yeah. I schooled in Lagos. My first school was Homeward Nursery and Primary School. I think that's a prep school where I went to do nursery. Then from there, Homeward, Homeward Nursery and Primary School actually was in Suruleri as well, not too far from where we, where we lived at the Holy Trinity Church Ikate. And um, from there, I moved to Yaba Model Primary School, uh, Nathan Street, Yaba, around the, I think there's this zoo in Yaba then, I think. Oh. So then from there, okay, I have a story. <laughs> <laughs> you know, when I was in primary five, <clears throat> I did a common entrance. I passed. I was meant to go to federal government Girls College, Wawa. Okay. But then my dad was in England. My mom was in England. My dad was studying at Hoke Hill College of Theology in, in England. Wow. So I, my parents were like, oh, no, you can't go. You're too young. I'm like, I'm not young. We, three of us passed in the school, in the whole of uh, the uh, Yaba model. Why won't I go? But my dad was like, oh, you're too young. You can't go to Burden House, blah, blah, blah. I said, but some people say there's a college in Lagos, which is Queen's College. Ah. Why can't I go to Queen's College? He's like, no, you are too young. You, can, you, know, have, to, you have to do primary six. Okay. I had to do primary six. No problem. By that time, Jack only has come. The Lagos State government then, you know, a yeah. governor then. Yeah. So he started all these Jack only schools and stuff like that. Because I was being forced to, to do primary six, I did primary six, so there was no even, there was no exam. Jack only was just sending people to school, you wow. know. So no exam. So I've... I worked hard to do that common entrance to go to a federal government college, but unfortunately, no. So primary six came. I was hoping, okay, well, we'll see where we'll go. But Jack Conde sent me to one of your schools, Claire Guess High School, Suruleri. That school used to be my primary school. Yeah, wow. Suruleri Baptist, Suruleri Baptist School. Suruleri Baptist School, yeah. That building, you know. Oh, okay, basically, I'll okay. uh, just give a context to it, you know. <laughs> um, education in Lagos State in the 70s, was very chaotic. Mm. They had morning session and afternoon session. Yeah. We did not have yeah. enough schools for yeah. the population. Wow. So in 1979, um, the civilian governor, Latif Kaude Jakonde, yeah. he, he wanted to stop the idea of having a morning session and an evening session. He felt that young people should go to school from about 7 o'clock to 2 o'clock. Why right. should some people go to school in the morning and other school in the evening? Mm. He, he didn't like that. Um, I don't know, dichotomy or whatever. He wanted people, so he needed to build um, more, more classrooms, get teachers, you know, and it was an intervention thing that he had to do. And so they created all sorts of schools. And to make that work, they sort of de-emphasized private schools right. and people were deployed. I mean, if you now happen to be the daughter of a clergy, your ten- the tendency is that you follow what the governor 
once. I remember once she was telling me the story that Pastor, when she said she wasn't going, Pastor, hey, you go to Akinwale yeah, Girls High School. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, when, when, when I told him, when I said, this is where they said I should go, I don't know the school. I, I've never heard of it before. And my dad was in England. And it, we had this uncle with us. He's, not, he's even now a reverend as well. Uncle George. George. So he was the one, you know, supervising us at home while my dad, while my parents were away. So I said to him that, oh, look at what they gave me, this paper. I should go to this school. I said, I don't know this school. I've never heard of it before. So when my daddy called, the uncle said, oh, I, I needed to, he needed to report me, you know. <laughs> and my daddy, I got on the phone and I said to him that, well, this is the school they gave me. I don't know the school. I don't know where it is. He said, oh, but the address is there. I said, I don't know. But you know what? I'm not going. My father said, oh, you're not going. I said, because I wanted to go to Federal Government College. He didn't let me go. <laughs> and somebody told me you could have sent me to Queen's College. You didn't send me to Queen's College. So I'm not going to this school. He said, okay, wait for me till I come. <laughs> when I come <laughs> back, you will go to Akinwale Gesa school. school. I was stupid. I was foolish. I was excited. <laughs> I said, yes, I am not going to that school. I'm going to Akinwale Gesa school. What was the significance of Akinwale? No, That's my father's name. It was, a joke. My, it was typical name. Yoruba man's my name joke. Is, say, You're my not name serious. Is, you know? uh, I see. I see. I see. Name, uh, right, right, right. My name is Akinwale. So you go to his school, basically. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Worry because then I've, you had, go to a public I've, school. Had, yeah, I've yeah. had that. Oh, this school they call it Jack on this school, Jack on this school. Yeah. So if I will go to Akimali, <laughs> that's okay because I was stupid. I thought, oh, so I thought it meant, yeah, you know, yeah. So after I, I handed the phone to the uncle, he was just looking at me and saying, You see, why are you there? <laughs> if you don't go to school, I, you know what? For two weeks, school started. And you didn't two, go to I school. did not go to school. Wow. I was at home. Waiting for Akimale Waiting for Akimale Akimale High, school. High School. And when the uncle said to me that, Tony, are you not going to go to school? I said, no, that when daddy comes, I will go to school. That's what I said. I'll go to Akimale Gets High School. He said, Simba, Fwelegba. <laughs> Simba, Fwel. If I beat you, eh? I said, okay, no problem. So I, I went to school when the school had already started. Wow. And I had a very grand welcome because, you know, this is a student who didn't come when her mates were coming. So I went straight to the principal's office. And she welcomed me. She was like, wow, you're such an intelligent girl, tall, beautiful girl. Wow. I'm impressed that I have a student like you. Wow. I was like, oh, my God. I didn't want to come here. <laughs> but in the end. But, you know, at the end of the day. She became head girl. <laughs> I was I, yeah, I was wow. one head of the prefects. Yeah. I, I became head girl at one time. Then, you know, because we are the first set, actually. Of the school. Yeah, it was just. Oh. So the, every year they, we had prefects. So at one point, at one point I was a head girl, assistant head girl, labor prefect. So I was part of the you know, leadership of leadership. Labor. Yeah, that, actually that school and the principal. I, I give all glory and thanks to my principal, Mrs. Akintobi. She's still alive today. Wow. So she loved me so much. She loved me like a daughter. She. I remember her telling me one day that, look, I like you. You're just very intelligent. That you know every day. You should write 10 words and their meanings that she's going to put me forward to go and be representing the school wherever, anywhere. Wow. So that was it for me. Maybe it was a blessing in disguise, but I still didn't like it. I I would, <laughs> let, me, let, me, <laughs> let me come in here, please, if you don't mind. No, no, please. The story she has said now reenacted itself in the life of our fourth daughter, mm. Desola, that went to Oxford. I don't know if I should say it or she should narrate the story, but basically we hear is what I'm trying to say. I struggle with parents in the UK. Mm. They want to put their life savings on sending their kids to private schools and they hands off totally. Mm. So, yeah, you have a good job. You work with NHS, you work in the city, you want your child to go to a private school, but then you're hands off. Mm. Now, when we got into this country in... 2007. Diana was nine or going to 10. Mm. So, by the system, she had to go to year six. Yeah. And our youngest daughter, Fola, was seven. seven. So, we thought they would both go to the Catholic uh, right. school. But what happened? Diana was told. Can you, I yeah. know that. Okay, when we, we, we wanted them to go to uh, Catholic Our Lady of Lords. Yeah. So, when we got to the place, you know, I took Fola and Diana. And the head teacher saw Diana was like, oh, no. She, she said she was too tall wow. for the class, you know. And I thought, oh, wow, she's just 
10. She, you know, she was like, oh, no, that they already have a tall black girl in the school. I was wow. like, wow. Anyway, I was upset, but I was also praying that just take this, the, the take it, you know. <laughs> anyway, so Diana had to go to a state school on Bose yeah. Road. Yeah. Right. So what I'm trying to say is that what happened in Toyin's life many years back, it's all re- reenacted itself yeah. in the U- in UK, in London. Interesting. With our four daughter, is like okay. This is the preferred school. The states, the the teacher, you know, whatever, would not take her. She had to go to Bose Primary School. Yeah. Now, at Bose Primary School, she had a head teacher. I can't remember her name. A Greek I lady. Yeah. Anyway, who, Dana who, who ended up. Her? Dana ended up going to Darwin Street. Wow. Because she had, she wrote an essay or an assignment. I don't yeah. know. I wasn't in education. There was something send she my, wrote. Yeah, send, send my, my send my friends to, to school. school. Wow. Yeah. So I think they it was the, so good. The, the head teacher was so impressed. And when it was time for them to send some people, the borough wanted uh, some schools to send uh, their students or pupils to to meet with uh, the then prime minister Gordon Brown. Gordon Brown. So and she then, was one of. She was wow. One of them. And I just got a call from the school that oh, you know we would like. Diana to go to Darwin Street. I'm like, what was she going to do there? <laughs> well, who knows this girl in this place, you know, that she's just a new student, you know. So yeah, that, that she's very good that, you know, she, she wrote something and they wanted, her to, they wanted her to go and present it to the Prime Minister. Prime I'm like, Brown. wow. Okay, that was it. And so here's my story. <laughs> you know, um, Toyi ended up going to a Jack Hunter school against her <laughs> wish or preference. That turned out to the, be... The, the head... Teacher in our school loved her, gave her a lot of leadership opportunities yeah. and stuff like that. The same thing, Dinah wanted to go to Our Lady of Lords, and the system said, No, go to Bose go to Prior community. School. <laughs> she went to the community school, she was good. That took her to 10 Downing Street. Fast forward, Dinah ended up going to Oxford on a scholarship. So here's my take that, you know, um, sometimes as parents, mm. we could be fussy or even as individuals. We don't know what the future, I call the corridor effect. Mm. You know, you step in the corridor, you don't know what the future holds. And that's why for me, sometimes we need to be grounded in faith and connecting to what the universe wants for us. Um, there's so many stories of somebody presenting you a car, a key to a car in the Bible or whatever. The presentation of things should not derail us from our purpose mm. um when i was told about this podcast for me i was a bit worried that what's all this about i i, I don't know what h to h is but in trying to prepare for it i think it's like plotting the dots backwards um over 60 i've had a lovely career all my kids have graduated they're working and i'm in retirement mode more or less so it now, this session is an opportunity mm. for me to be grateful and to reflect on my journey to where I am. So for me, you know, some people say sometimes you need to plot the dot backwards. But in life, particularly when you say age to age, the young generation. So what I'm saying is young people need to take decisions. Mm. And I think particularly for me, because also as a first child and a firstborn, um, taking decisions in life was always not a challenge but there was no template so you were the first born yeah ah. so so how can we help the young generation to connect to the, i don't know to the future and i know decision making is very critical but sometimes parents don't help their kids we treat children like pets mm. We don't build the character of our children. We don't strengthen our children to be able to discern and take decisions. So here's something that I'd like to pick your brains on then. Just following on from that point. <clears throat> I'm a young father as well. I have a three-year-old daughter. You, I know the answer to this, but I'll ask anyway. So how many children do you have? I have five daughters. So you have five daughters. What do you think is... It's skipping ahead again, but what would you say has been the, the most integral lesson that you could pass on to me when it comes to raising daughters? First of all, um, I'm Catholic, um, and my my faith mm. uh, teaches me that you know every child is a gift from God. It's like you do a lucky dip. 
and biologically they say uh, men have x and y chromosomes <laughs> women have all x chromosomes and one chromosome or one whatever and stuff like that so what i'm trying to say is that what you get in a child in terms of gender biologically the determinant is from the man mm -hmm. but god decides what you take so it's like a lucky dip so i'm gender neutral when it comes to raising kids okay i think my daughters will say i don't know and i've had this before because they used to do gardens they do, that <laughs> i think they will say that they raised them which is not, I don't think it's correct. So basically <laughs> what I'm trying to say, I think I'm gender neutral. What I think is important is like build the character of your child, help them to be able to live life on their own. And I'll confess this to you. Uh, I got married at 30. I'd gone school, through school very early. So I had many years to look forward to getting married. I would speak to older people. I graduated in 83, I was 21. So, so from 21 to 30, I had like nine years to decide what I want to do with my life. I kept trying to research when is a good time to marry and how do you decide who you marry. So how, did you, how did you research that? Okay, fine. <laughs> so that's why I'm saying I'm giving gratitude to these two late men. Okay, names. sure. The Sunday body and my uncle, Kola Panero. I spoke to my uncle, Kola Panero, and he said, fast forward when you're 50 and you go to the altar for Thanksgiving on your 50th birthday, what do you want your party to look like? Wow. Then the Sunday, but the Sunday body, we did MBA together in New Like He was working in IB, I, IMB Merchant Bank. I okay. was MBA straight from school. You know? So he was in exec club. We used to have some joint sessions, you know, and he had the BMW. I used to drive his car <laughs> around and stuff like that. So, and I realized the son wasn't married. Big boy in the bank, you know, I'll go to his house in Ikoi and everything. And I was worried that you're not married, you know. And so, so he said to me, as a man, when you lose your ability to discern a good woman, it becomes difficult to get married. And this is basically what he said to me. So the age a man marries is between that period when you want to make sure that you want to raise kids and they're not too old. So when you're, when you're 50, for example, you're going for Thanksgiving on your 50th birthday, you're not taking Having toddlers. toddlers. Yeah. Yeah. And to the point where you want to be able to pick a woman that genuinely loves you. So if you're a big boy and you have all the BMWs and the whatever, according to late Disorder Body, any girl that you meet will act perfect. Because you would have lost the ability to discern. Yeah. So you can't tell you can't you can't tell a good or a bad woman. That is interesting. Because any woman that comes into your space sees your luxury apartment, your luxury ride, or more. And behaves accordingly. Yeah, it'd be in Makusi. <laughs> and she, she now goes home and tells her mother, mm. oh, I went to see this boy today. Like, ah. And when I say, ah, that's where you are going. Mm. And you know, you work very hard for those things. And then there's a woman in your life who has her own game plan. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it becomes so, an arrangement. So fast forward, eventually, with due respect, this Egmont that I respect a great deal ended up marrying a colleague at work. Right. Actually, his secretary, somebody who, you know, they had worked closely and he could probably trust better than any other woman that came into his space. Right, right. So I don't know if I have answered your question. I know we got no, here you, from you, trying to say... The, the thing was, you also wanted to know what you would tell him, what advice you give him to yeah. raise a girl. Okay, to advice yeah. to raise a girl. Basically, you know, um, okay, I say to my wife, when people say... I have all girls. And I remember when we moved into the UK and I was shuttling, a lot of people said to my wife that your husband is trying to get rid of you, <laughs> that he has pushed you out of sight to London to stay with the five girls so that he can start a new life with other women. You know what's funny about that is, um, and I, you know, it's not news to us that we, I'm sure we know people who stories follow that mm -hmm. pattern. Yeah. So it's not, when people usually say that, because in my life, I used to think people come up with these sort of stories just out of thin air, but there's validity to it because mm. there are people that we both know, or we, we all know who, that's been their journey, that's been their life. Mm. And you get to the funeral and suddenly a whole different family show up, you know. Uh, 
So to well, strange. So so what where I was going to is like in raising a girl child, I think you need to help that child to be able to make her decisions. So you need to strengthen the character. Now, every child, male or female, needs strong character and strong decision making ability. Yeah. Now, it is their choices that will differ because of gender. I'll have three grandkids, two granddaughters and a grandson. Now, I play with all three of them. But when I play with Leo, I say to Leo, I'm waiting for your Lamborghini that will drive around the city. But I don't say that to Kamsi. And I say to Kamsi, I'm looking to come and spend time in your luxury flat in Switzerland or something. You know, so what I think the gender thing does is like, it's a section of the department store that you go to. But the character that you're building is the same. Right. It's so if you're, you're buying a car, the engine is the same, but the trim are different. Mm. You buy a Nissan Athena, uh, or sorry, a Senta, or you buy a Tecna, you know, so the trim. So the difference for me in raising children, male or female, is, is the gender sensitivity. Right. Which is like icing on the cake. But you want to make bake a good cake. The character so is... to, be, to build a good cake is that help your child to build a strong character and can make decisions. What tends to happen in life is as kids go through life, they want approval and acceptance. That's when you have problems with gangs and courts and whatever. And also because I think, with due respect, I'm grateful. I think, with due respect, I'm grateful. That parents are busy chasing bills or money to pay bills. And the kids are left to the system, to the school. Yeah. And a child is like, okay, what do I do? I'll do what my friends do. Yeah. It's a vicious circle because parents act that way because of their background or upbringing or also because they, I don't know, coming from where we come from, there is a lot to survive so that Absolutely. you can get stuck in trying to survive and you never quite get to it's like a crab in a bucket you never get to the top of the bucket you never make drop, it out of yeah. the bucket so um but what that does is it also creates a vacuum especially if you have kids because then you're running two different races mm -hmm. you're trying to achieve something else and then you're missing from the lives of the people your children and then that's how i see it as a circle that just it, it feeds on itself you know so so basically it still goes back to character and decision making all my daughters had to pick subjects and now and even pick university careers i'll tell you for example i wanted diana to do law <laughs> diana said she wasn't going to do law i wanted Fola to do architecture so that's she was going to do architecture and um, yosola <laughs> my second daughter she wanted to do literature but but we had this so for yosola we had this conversation Fola wanted to do anthropology mm. we had this conversation so what i'm trying to say is that make sure that you can have conversations with your kids and respect their space. So I'll now go back to Diana in year nine or 10. Just before you do, I, and I've always wanted to ask this, you just said that you wanted one of your children to do architecture, you wanted an, another to do law. Where does that come from? The, it's the, a Nigerian heritage thing. I don't know if it's heritage, but it's a Nigerian story that you want your kids to be successful. And historically, Nigerians have felt that only professionals are successful. You don't right. want you to do a manual labor. You want you to be. <laughs> you want you to sit in the big office and call the shots. Yeah. And yeah. you can only do that if you do things like law or medicine. Yeah. You know. And I'm a student of strategy. Mm. I don't follow the flock, and um, I pay a lot of gratitude to Saint Paul the Apostle. You know, and I say to my kids, you must have a profession. You must also be a tent maker. And so the choice of law or architecture was because I felt those would guarantee the future. And I'll now play back Diana's whatever. First of all, Diana had to pick subjects for GCSE. And then she had to pick a course at uni. Now, I don't know how much time we have. But basically, to answer your question... Diana said to me, after she graduated from King's College and got a scholarship to go to Oxford, mm -hmm. first of all, in her school, and even for her as well, the teachers were trying to force them to go to Oxford or Cambridge. Right. Because they felt they were bright, go yeah. and represent the school. Yeah. 
there's always a pressure about go and do this. But the way we've been, the way our kids have been raised is follow your mind. Mm. But first of all, you have to train that mind. Yeah. You yeah. don't want that mind to pick things on the street or <laughs> peer pressure. Yeah. So Diana said to me, Daddy, if I had done law, I won't be happy mm. and I won't be doing the things I'm doing today. Mm. You know, so when I said to, and then, then when we had that argument, I was trying to say, oh, Diana, you know, um, my perspective is that in corporate America, if you're a professional, the most successful professional, apart from IT, are uh, investment bankers or uh, legal counsels, because every CEO needs legal advice on decision making. Mm-hmm. And I felt, I wasn't saying you should do law because I wanted you to go to court or to litigate or help people to get um, visas or um, home office issues. That No, my, my, my vision of law, the same thing where I, I, I was having this conversation. Look, the good thing is, make sure you can have conversations with your children, male Absolutely. or female. Absolutely. And respect that space. Mm-hmm. So Diana said to me, she's not doing law. But before law, it was issue of, she picked her subject. She had taken the paper to school. She came back after how many days and said, Daddy, I want to change. I want to pick history. And I was terrified because I was horrible in history in school. <laughs> so I said, Diana, but we've already closed this. Why are you trying to make a change? And she said, what did she say? Is there a problem? Is there a problem with that? Wow. Yeah. That you have a problem with that. Yeah. So I said, look, okay, I don't have a problem with that, but I just want to be sure that, you know, this is an afterthought. Maybe mm-hmm. you went to school, you saw your friends, everybody's speaking, I want to be in that class. And I struggle with the history. Mm-hmm. I'm a visual learner. So you know, from your own, your own <laughs> perspective, what I know. Mm-hmm. But today, Diana is a writer and a researcher. She writes on things like Ghana Must Go, Jaguar Nana. You need to go and read her writings and you see how history plays up in contemporary things and real stuff. And I mean, I mean, sometimes with due respect, some people say she writes like Wale Shoenka. I do due respect, I'm grateful. But then it's the depth of the way she writes. But then for me, I see history playing up in the thing. And I, it's the same thing like maybe um, some writers, I know my favorite writer that lives in Switzerland, Paolo oh, Coelho. Coelho. Oh, Paolo Coelho. Coelho. He didn't want to be a writer. Uh, sorry, he wanted to. Be, his parents wanted to be a writer. He had, to, but he took a long, you know. So yeah, you know. And there are other people like that. So so for parents, that's the thing about parenting is like you would. Parenting op- is delicate. You mm. you will operate How from your own you? perspective, your own yeah. experience. Mm. But that child is not a dummy. So this might sound long winded, but I'll get to it. So something you said there about you not being great at history, so therefore wanting to dissuade her from Correct. taking up history. Correct. Um, something that starts to happen, especially after the loss of a parent or even when your parents are much older, is yeah. we then, and, and generally memory is always the good, you always remember the good things because the, the way the mind works, it filters out the negative things and it doesn't want to dwell on those things. Correct. So about the characters of our parents, we tend to mostly remember the things that they're great at and the things that they're good <laughs> at doing. Um, and sometimes if we're not very careful, um, we we have taken on some of their... Assume, yeah, we, yeah, yeah, exactly. My question is, are you? do you think you're able to see the flaws in your parents' lives? And, and what do you think those flaws have done for you as adults? Mide, thank you very much for this question. Uh, I don't know how much time you have, but basically I'll just... There is no time constraint. We'll, I, will, <laughs> I will hint that also with gratitude, Tony and I were certified trainers for people that want to get married. Um, we used to volunteer for two charities where they help young people that want to get married prepare. You know, in the Catholic Church, there's a prerequisite for your marriage. You must go through a oh, course. Sure. And so Tony and I were facilitators, trained facilitators. One of the modules, I can't remember, family of, you know, the things you leave behind. Family so things, of origin. Yeah. And the family going so so what you are talking about is the the body of knowledge supporting that is like you come with and they like use it. water lily they use water lily as an example <laughs> oh when you start that session the the, the visual is the water lily 
It looks beautiful on top, but you have tangled roots. Uh, so what you're trying to say is like, we as parents, we have the good and the bad side, and even our own parents as well. Yeah. So to answer your question is like, yes, we all take our reference from where we're coming from. Yeah. If a man has been beating his wife, his kids, or if a man, and I'll say this, and it's also cultural, Igbos don't like their male children going to the kitchen. Mm. And I'll say this publicly as well. You know, I have an Igbo son-in-law. But you know, with gratitude, he goes to the kitchen. If he comes here, he goes, Mommy, I want to eat jollof rice. I want, you know, and you know. But back home in Nigeria, the way the Igbo male is raised is like, he's a king. He should yeah. go into the kitchen. <laughs> yeah. But Osita comes there, he goes to the kitchen and says, Mommy, I want that plantain, I want that, you know. And sometimes you see him, you know, he'll do one or two dishes, <laughs> yeah, the glasses, we'll have a party and stuff like yeah. that. You know, so we will pick from culture and we also pick from parents. Mm. But with the benefit of learning mm. and contemporary life, for example, Maynard Keynes felt that once you get to a threshold of income in your life, you don't need to worry. But why we now realize that even old parents want iPhones. <laughs> in economics, Kenyan economics thought that once your income is maybe at 40,000 pounds, you're made for life. Yeah. But the reality of today is that, oh, tomorrow there are electric cars, there are iPads. So a man who, and I was saying to my kids, retirement and pension is history. Mm. Because now people are living longer. Yeah. And so you now retire at 62 or 67 or whatever, but you're still fit because medicine has helped us, environment, and you want to take holidays, you know, and, and someone's got to pay the income, for it. Yeah, yeah. So, so what I'm trying to say is like, in economics and society and sociology, there are things that are changed because those concepts are not real. Mm. The same thing about family and raising kids. I have aunties that told me that, what did they know? Mm. You know, so they only followed um, what their mothers told or what, them. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. But now, there's a lot of knowledge. There's the internet. Every child can research things. Yep. And with due respect, sometimes I go to Fala's room. She walks from home sometimes. And I go, when she's not there, I look at her desk and it's set a corporate executive. And I, I will gratitude and say, Fala is my baby. My, my, I mean, <laughs> my youngest daughter, I cannot imagine that I know more than Fala. She works with teams around the world. And so it's sometimes difficult for me to imagine that what does, <laughs> what does what I know? But mm. it's wrong. Mm. You know, so so parents too, I think, I'm not good with the Bible verses or quotes, but I think there's a part in the Bible where you say, even though the Bible says, honor, thy, honor your parents, there's also another part that I think that says that... Parents should not upset their children. Yeah, or, provoke. Or, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, so if God, and, that has, and that's what I'm saying, every child is a gift from God. Mm. God has packaged that child God packages a child with a provision is mm. for you to see it. There's no child that God has sent to this world, and this is contestable, that God has not prepared for. Mm. And I, I know people will argue about this, but you know, but, but, so my, that, but that's my own philosophy, that's my faith, that if God has given me this child to take, to nurture, he would also give me the grace. Mm. And that was what I was saying. One of the fears I had very early when I got married was God, and my prayer point was always, God, with due respect, I apologize to, you know, other people who might feel offended. I'd like, God, give me the grace to be able to nurture my kids to the point where they will not be afraid. Is a, I'm translating something culturally, but basically what you're saying is that you want to be there to be able to equip your children to run. Yeah, yeah. You know, and because, live better lives than you did. Yeah. Not you know. your constraints. So back to your questions. Yes, for example... My father was busy as an executive, but he gave me a lot of activity books to play with. Mm. And then my bad days, even when I was doing FGC in Elon Kwara, he would send his driver with things, you know, like Tony would always say, it's not the, it is your presence, mm. not the presence. Not the presence, yeah. Mm. So, <laughs> so what I think is, you know, that's the image of my father. And I say my father was a patriarch. And one of the issues my mother had with my father, 
she think my father was more invested in extended family than his nuclear family. Interesting. My mother felt that my father was giving away too much money to other people rather than, you know, con- consolidate or whatever. My father was a generous man. So, Because of hindsight, do you think you can explain why that is? I think it's also because of a portion of birth of my father. My father was the eldest of six children. Like you are? Yes. <laughs> His parents had little means. So he felt responsible? Correct. Now, you now marry a woman that thinks that it's you and I. Yeah. It's funny. With, would we consider that a flaw? I mean, the way... It's not um, a the way flaw. It's made. a reality. It's, it's not how yeah. you now balance it. Exactly, yeah. It's not how you now balance it. It's the same thing about, oh, I think my daughter should not do history. <laughs> or I want my daughter to do architecture because I was very good. I loved... Architecture was my first jump, whatever, but I didn't get to do architecture. <laughs> yeah. So I can't leave my life in my daughter. Yeah. Mm. So I, I now said to my daughter, what do you want to study? She said, anthropology. And I said, well, do you know what anthropology is? I didn't just say, no, 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 shut up, you know. Mm-mm. Do you know what anthropology is? Yeah, I know, I know. She now told me, I said, oh, okay, how people live in the past. Mm. So I go back to St. Paul and I say, okay, I always tell them, when you're picking a, a course or a career, you should think of the investment you wear to the marketplace because mm-hmm. that's where you need to pay your bills. That if you study anthropology, how are you going to pay your bills? I can't remember if she was able to answer the question or whatever, but I said, okay, if you study anthropology, maybe you work for the police or you work in social, whatever, because you will have understood how people think, think or whatever. But here was a student, here was a child that was very good in geography and I remember her geography teacher, Mr. Shikuwadi, used to say President Fola. Wow. And used to showcase her geography scripts and whatever, you know. And so I said, okay, you want to research the past. And I said, if that's where God has endowed you, why don't you apply it to how people will live in the future? Mm. And on our own, she came back with urban planning. I didn't know what urban planning was. But you could see the dots connect. Yeah, yeah that, that's what I'm saying. We yeah. had that, that conversation. Mm. So I wanted her to play to her strengths, mm. which is also with Diana. I didn't know Diana had strengths in history. I was horrible in history. <laughs> yeah. But we, but yeah. we had that honest conversation. Mm. And Diana said to me, Daddy, uh, if I had done law, I wouldn't... I probably won't get an Oxford, uh, an Oxford scholarship. Yeah. I won't be what I'm doing today. You understand what I'm saying? So yeah. God has packaged each child. Yeah. Either you send that child to a private school or to a public school, just nurture that child. Mm. Help that child mm. to find what God's purpose for them or each of them is. is. I, I remember you saying you were very close with your mom. Mm-hmm. Do you think you're now in a place where you're able to see her flaws and some of the things she wasn't very good at? Well... I think so. Yeah. And the thing is, seeing my mother's flaws now, at least from what I knew about her, and I think I have a bit of that. (laughs) It's like being too quiet, just... Let's let it go. I'll go, know, I'll go, I'll go back. Whatever. Sorry, I don't, I, I'm not dominating this, but yes. I want to support what she's trying. You know, you know in marriage, cost them um, when there's a conflict in mm. marriage, fight of uh, fight, fight or, or flight, but yeah. So, you know, sometimes when and it happens in every relationship, something has gone wrong. So, do you talk about it? Or do you withdraw? Do you deal with it? Or do you? Manage it. And I think what Twain is trying to allude to is the fact that, and I, let me, that's why I'm saying that, because when we have issues, I want to talk about them. Okay. Twain wants to, so I don't know, maybe, I don't yeah. know. Yeah. So. That's what I'm saying that, what, what I noticed my mom used to do, that I never saw her fight with my dad. Right. So I thought, okay, that's it. Way to be. Thing. Mm. I got married, and of course, when you know each other very well, He talks a lot. Like, I don't talk too much. And so you can now imagine when there's an argument. And I don't have energy for that. You know, I'd rather just, I'll just withdraw from it. It's not as if we're not going to talk about it later. Or, you know, there's a way that everything will just, you know, come together again. 
But mine is, I don't, I don't like to be confrontational. Mm. I don't like it because living with some, some neighbors when I was younger in a papa, the woman was confrontational. Mm. And knowing my own mother, she wasn't confrontational. When you now see the result of being confrontational, mm. the outcome, the outcome mm. is, is bad. It, as avoidable. It's like you're confrontational, at the end of the day, somebody dies. Mm. Come on. Mm. Why? The same thing I tell my driver. When so I'd rather, I rather, okay, if you are Let mad, it go. be mad. Mm. I'm not going to. So both of us cannot be mad at the same time. So I'll just take that, you know, flight mm. ticket <laughs> <laughs> and just, and while I'm like that, it's not as if I'm not thinking about it. But it's your natural I'm disposition. Yeah. I'm reflect. I'm very contemplative. Mm. So I'm just like, okay. Why did this happen? How can this? How can we avoid this next time? It's not as if I'm not thinking about it. And I, I also think that sometimes when I'm even thinking about it, I overthink about it. Which at the end of the day, I have to tell myself that that's enough. <laughs> that's enough. Whatever happens, but I will never be confrontational, mm. and I will never be, you know, like, you know, aggressive. Mm. You know, there is no point because. Mm. I've, I've seen a lot, I, because I'm a child of a vicar, a reverend, a lot of things I've witnessed. Somebody will come to church today, in a few hours' time, you will hear Ari Wogbo, ah, this has happened. Chief Umati, cool, chief is dead. What happened? Chief's wife hit him on the head with a bottle. He's dead. Chief wife has to go to the to, to Kirikiri. Wow. So, I've grown <laughs> up in an environment where I've seen all sorts. You know mm. what, what, what priests see? What mm. vicars see? Not everybody see. Wow. So, and living in that kind of environment, I know what, what, what could happen. Wow. So for me, is this something that will cool down at the end of the day? Yeah, let it It'll cool down. Blow away. Even if it blows away in three months, I don't care. Mm. But we can avoid something. Taking a life or destroying another person's life. So that's, that's me. It's interesting seeing that dynamic in, in the both of you. And so I'm assuming if you, if you are more akin to flight, then yeah. you are more akin because to... My mom, my yeah. mom, my mom was always, even when she's, she's, I don't know. I've never seen my mom and daddy, you know... Bicker or fight. Yeah, I've never. But sometimes I'll see that she's just quiet. Even, you know, when customers come, they want to buy something, they want to pay for something. She'll just say... Let my daughter handle it. Then I suspected Something there, was, there was a problem. But she was not talking about it. And I, I was young. I couldn't have asked, oh, what's going on? Even if she told me, I may not understand. Mm. You know. So mm. that's it. And as I'm saying that, if I found whatever flaws my mod, mother had, maybe I picked some of them. Mm. But then at the end of the day, I don't see that as a flaw. But I see it as something that, look, Fine. I know today, in this, the world of today, it's good to, to have conversations. Yeah. But you know, sometimes it depends on what energy you have. Well, the mm. principle is, yes. I don't have energy for... The principle is you, you must know. have the conversation, but prepare for the conversation. Don't let the conversation be spontaneous. Mm. And I think that's why I have a okay. weakness, you know. <laughs> I want to deal with things, you know, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a task person. I, you know, I want to deal with the issue. Thank you. Thank you so much for listening to this episode. And I guarantee you the second half of the episode will be with you very shortly. Um, like I always say, if this is your first time on this podcast, why don't you click share, subscribe, and um, forward this on to somebody who you think could benefit from this conversation. We're really looking to grow this podcast and get it out to even more listeners than we currently have. So thank you again for being on the podcast and 